Welcome to Voice Club and to the second part of our mini-series with the psychedelic philosopher Peter Shusted H. I do recommend listening to the first part but feel this conversation does stand on its own without that background. But allow me just a few minutes to introduce things. In the first part, we covered some core aspects of Peter's approach to philosophy and discussed how psychedelic experience might be brought to bear on such an approach. We also discussed Bergson's notion of duration, one of those less common concepts which I think is centrally important to grapple with. We now pick up the conversation at the close of a discussion about the relationship between psychedelic experience and death. Loosely, the idea was something like that psychedelics, perhaps, offer an insight into what it is to experience a state in which your ordinary sense of self is at least significantly diminished, where such a state might be speculatively considered analogous to a metaphorical and perhaps other than just metaphorical sense of death. Now, this conversation begins with my transitioning to the link between this psychedelic state and the mystical or religious experience, but moreover to the process which seems to characterize the journey to and from such a domain. The idea I lay out in this opening is largely central to what follows. We touch on Nietzsche, Bergson, Jung, Schopenhauer, Whitehead, Jordan Peterson, myth, telos, the relation between left and right, and Peter's own meta-ethical view named neo-nihilism, a position which denies the existence of objective values while preserving the notion of subjective values. To this I tried to promote to Peter a view grounded on an affirmation of life, construed as a transformative, adaptive, harmonizing process. There are of course many questions, but a speculative one might be, can psychedelic experience allow the traversal between certain experiential levels, aiding the apprehension of a metaphysical telos or purpose? Hey, it's just a good old chat. Peter's well worth listening to. People often talk about psychedelics as well as, and they commonly do, frequently do, induce so-called mystical experiences, Mm. which might be synonymously termed with religious experiences, depending on what you think about it, where in some sense you have what we've spoken about in death there, Mm. sort of seems to be lending itself to talking about the kind of dissolution in a sense that the total fragmentation back into the, the potential from which everything comes. Notions of God are often contrasted with that, where God is understood as to be that which is fully actual, or with everything brought together, somehow perfect and totally mm. actualized, and everywhere and everything. Um, and so people often have this other rapturous experience too. After the death occurs, they are somehow more real than they've ever mm. been before. And I, I don't know if I can relate to that precisely. I, I believe I've certainly held what I can only term a sort of communion with this source of divinity. And it felt very much at the time as a fragmentary one, as though I had gone to a place, I... I bore out a fragmentary relation very experientially in a very experientially real way to this otherness that became one with me is so fucking esoteric orison that's known as i think becoming one with god if you call it god and so and so i never became totally one with it i I, it was it was though i it was though in the moment of arriving at it i realized that the the next movement then was to was to return it was to re- return back as it happened to the group dynamic that I was a part of. There were other people around me at the time and there were all sorts of, you know, um, not disputes exactly going on there, but all people at various different stages in life and in the journey of the night and doing whatever they were. And, and um, it seemed like part of the role then became one of attempting to find harmony again with the group. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mentioned this idea to you before as well. And, and, that, and that's something like, this idea that grips me is that is that life itself to the extent that it is vital and living and updating and and respond responding appropriately to anomaly and not over fixing itself it must participate in a sort of harmonizing process that can interact with what is beyond it and then bring back what is beyond it to adapt itself but that it can never attain that final place of perfection Mm -hmm. or utopia because to do so loses movement fundamentally Mm -hmm. 
and to bring it back to, to Bergson, if you attain fixation, you lose movement. And so to the extent that we continue to be for life and have it and have it be on the cusp of what is real and moving, mm. the most we can aim for and what we should aim for ethically is the harmonization of the updating of mm. knowledge structures and not their final resting place. In a way that makes me think of Schopenhauer more than Bergson even, because you know, for him, there's this ultimate will, which is at the center of all things. And uh, fundamentally that's one thing, but in each individual it's differentiated as such. This is why he's known as pessimist ultimately really, because um, the will is a striving constant striving mm -hmm. for him to life, for Nietzsche to power. But for Schopenhauer, once you've attained something, it sort of reduces to ash, to dust, and you don't care about it anyway. If you don't attain what you need, it's frustration. And if you, if you lose any um, higher goals, it ends in boredom, and that's life. You know? oh, love for the is process <laughs> of dance. Where is that in Schopenhauer? Well, How can he retain a love for music then? Well, because, ah, because for, for Schopenhauer, music takes one away, you see, art takes one away from the will. It's a, it's a pacifying of the will. So, um, Ooh, that's interesting. Partly based on uh, Kant's notion of uh, aesthetics from the critique of judgment. But How do you feel about that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, Nietzsche disagrees with it. He, he says that um, actually real art, you know, good art, affirms life, yes. pushes one into life, is a tonic to life and power, because well, life is power for him. But for Schopenhauer, yeah, it, it takes away the will. Another way of doing that is the Eastern forms of religion. You know, they try to suppress the will, he argues. But art is another form. It takes one away from the will because one contemplates the pure forms. And he gets Platonic here. He's got a version of Platonism, mm -hmm. which is pure consciousness without will. So for Schopenhauer, the will is one thing, but consciousness is another thing. Right. Consciousness acts in the service, ultimately, of the will. That's why he doesn't believe in free will. Right. Because the will is determine, determines one's actions. Consciousness does not determine one's actions. But with art, one can, as it were, elevate oneself away from the will of practical needs. One enters this eternal state of fixation on eternal ideas, you know, the Platonic forms. Dangerous. Can be. There's a paper to be written here about the relationship between that thought and psychedelics again, because, as you probably know, most often, in my experience, when one takes psychedelics, one's sort of practical will subsides, it goes away, you know? I mean, it's very difficult to move one's body. You, know, think, you think, for example, yeah, I need to, need to move to that chair over there to, to get that tea or yep. something like this. But your body doesn't, it says, nah, you know, it doesn't respond. You know, you will somehow, and actually most of the case, time you don't even care. You just think you want that tea for like aesthetic reasons, right? right Not right. because you're thirsty or for caffeine or whatever. So here's the interesting thing. So it seems like the real loss of practical will with psychedelics, at the same time, a huge flourishing of consciousness because suddenly consciousness is not in the service of the practical will. This is where it again links to Bergson. So there's a huge flourishing of consciousness. That's a psychedelic experience. And then it seems to me that, well, certainly I've had these experiences now and again of ultimate forms of beauty, you know, like um, even seemingly artificial. So not just natural forms, you know, plants, whatnot, flowers, but also, you know, spaceships. <laughs> yeah. Sounds crazy, but I've seen the most beautiful spaceship, you know. Mm. It looks like it's made by aliens, whatever. But it has a kind of, you know, sort of um, surreal beauty. And at one point, it just, boom, it's suddenly that's perfection. Mm. And it goes, goes away again. Also, from Whitehead, I don't really believe in the dichotomy between na nature and the artificial anyway, because we are part of nature. Right. And our cars and our pollution are thus part of nature as well. You know, like a bird's nest is part of nature. So once you sort of um, break down that organic, inorganic dichotomy, yes. and you, you really, you know, start to see uh, reality in a sort of non-conceptual way yes and you can appreciate the beauty in anything yes not just a forest or a flower or whatnot so yeah interestingly can can psychedelics break down the will and thus bring one to a tranquil state of pure contemplation which is good for schopenhauer because the will like i say only leads to despair ultimately in whatever form mm. um, i think yeah they can however at the same time you know the will as they call it Perhaps you could make that analogy with the ego as well, with the will. You know, it's not exactly the same thing in Freud, but the ego is, you know, we need it. To have evolved to the complex organisms we are now, we need ego and will and self-survival and power and right. resources and whatever. You know, without it, we would have got nowhere. And without it, even now in a sort of um, future state, if no one had, you know, that will, there would be much less, if any, competition for not necessarily destructive competition, but competition to attain, you know, greater vehicles or whatever, or greater forms of art yeah. or, or whatever, you know. 
Just the stability of a society with so many people requires, and just the complexity of the world requires a sort of um, pragmatism afforded by the ego. Pragmatism, yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, the great works of art would not have been possible were it not for the will, which, you know, if you believe it, you know, informed evolution and thus, you know, within one organism, you know, the development of one's artistic talent, which is probably there from the beginning, but one develops it, you know. So in order to get oneself out of the will, will is a sort of a precondition, interestingly. Yeah, this is interesting. I don't often think about, um, so we have on the one hand will here, and what are you juxtaposing that with in this case? The sort of a aesthetic possibility for consciousness? Well, Schopenhauer calls it something like willless contemplation, you know, aesthetic contemplation, which is willless if you accept Schopenhauer, which, like I say, is a controversial issue, like Nietzsche didn't, but... Yeah, it's hard for me at the moment to grasp on to how to differentiate these two things, or, or that, I, that I should differentiate them. But think of it this way, I mean, consciousness, in most cases, if we talk about so-called phenomenal, no, access consciousness, which is awareness, is by definition awareness or phenomenal, whereas the will uh, in most cases is subconscious, you know. It's not something we're necessarily aware of. And in fact, uh, one of the sort of purposes of therapy often is to become aware of one's subconscious will and then somehow align one's consciousness to that, become in harmony with oneself, as it were. Absolutely. And for, for Jung, it might be something like to become aware of the archetypes at play in the entirety of your psyche. And doesn't he call that individuation, absolutely. ultimately? Yeah. yeah so absolutely. it's something akin to that. And also, interestingly, with Jung, in relation to the thing as I was been speaking about, is the, uh, the shadow, you know, one of the main archetypes. Yes. Uh, the dark side, as yes. it were. And this yes. is something that Nietzsche, I think, gets one in touch with more than anyone else. Well, no, I, I think it's so important because, of course, to be aware of the possibility for, for good in life, just very generally, I think you only get there by recognizing and living with the other side of the coin, too. The bad. <laughs> the well, yeah. The, the, or the dark shadow. Side. Yeah, yeah, the, the dark shadow. side. If you only knew the power yeah, you know, yeah. of the dark side. But, yeah, well, why do we call it the dark side, though? Because, you know, from Nietzschean point of view, well, because our morals have become completely skewed. So, you know, we often think of the sort of, um, you know, the morbid or the gothic or whatever, so somehow, uh, you know, equivalent to an evil. But if you go beyond good and evil, as Nietzsche says, um, then you don't see it that way. You see it as another aspect of reality, a bit like the false dichotomy between the organic and inorganic through Whitehead and others. So if one thinks that way in advance, and then one has an experience, psychedelic experience of typically morbid things like skulls and, and whatever, then one can accept it and endorse it, you know, and bring it into oneself and let, make it enrich one's life. And perhaps that would be an element of what, what Jung calls individuation. Yes, no, absolutely. I think it's, it's, Fundamentally crucial to do so. Um, Jordan Peterson always makes this point, referencing Solzhenitsyn. I've mentioned it before on the podcast, but that the line between good and evil runs through every human heart. And so I, I wonder if there's an, an analogy there to, to transcending the recognition that you have the capability for the most heinous acts of evil as well as you do for good. is perhaps some, some way analogous to going beyond good and evil. I don't know about that. So, But the thing for me is that, and this is the idea I keep harping back to here, if on the Nietzschean kind of view where it sort of looks to reveal the arbitrary nature of our current value structure, of values of this particular culture, mm -hmm. that they might as well just have been another way or that we may be able to transcend them in some, in some way. Even that process needs to be subservient to, should it be for life, is the process that enables the adaptation itself. Right. Because if not... If you end up with a certain fixed morality of particular beliefs and actions and even a knowledge structure, a fixed knowledge structure, you have their stagnation and mm. you have not there, you are not there ready to go out into the unknown. And, it, it's the, and this is the classic yeah. story reference mythically over and over throughout the history of, of the world, really, the, the, the mythologies of the world. And this yeah. is the central idea that grounds Jordan Peterson's work and, um, in my view, it grounds at the end of the day, his popularity. So ultimately representing a sort of um, conflict in the social harmony to thereby overcome it and keep moving on. Is that what it is? Yeah, it's, it's recognizing that there will always be a, that there is always an interplay between order and chaos and that structures, should they maintain a fixed mm. nature for too long, tend toward corruption because yeah. they don't make use of the left would say, immigrants, if we take it to this really surface level. And the right would say, no, no, let's, let's put more walls up. Let's put more borders up. We, can't, we don't want to take the unknown. Things are good as they are. We have the sanctuary here. 
but no, the sanctuary and the and the life is to be found in the eternal harmonization. Mm. Um, and and so the process of logos then becomes that which can mediate between order and chaos right. in in dialogue and communication. And so what one method that I know of that, of course, is the f- famous um, Nordic pantheon and Ragnarok, which is that the gods maintain order. The giants, you know, try to maintain chaos, mm-hmm. and that will come to a final conflict in Ragnarok, where the giants will win, but that will usher in a new age, and thus it continues. Well, absolutely, and if chaos overwhelms, there is the potential for radically new order to come of it. This is Whitehead, you know, he says, um, in different ages, the notion of importance, ultimate value, is sometimes placed into religion, and other times into morality, I think that's what we're living in now, and other times logic or reason, and other times art. But importance transcends all of those, mm. and it, it can fluctuate, and whatever sort of becomes settled and established, really, you know, for the progress, and what it does believe in progress, for the progress of the universe, which is a, sort of manifested within life forms, uh, there needs to constantly be questioning, because yes, ultimate... It's the question. Yeah, ultimate questioning and being a contrarian and um, uh, criticism, because without it, yeah, as you say, we can never attain full knowledge. Mm-hmm. So any ideology which claims it is immediately begins to stagnate. And that's where you get, think, then you get the figures in history, which are the sort of um, the hammers, as it were. Nietzsche is one of them, uh, Luther, another one. You know, it, it, the interesting thing, it doesn't need to be of any side, you know. It's just something contrary to what is common. So if Nietzsche was, if that, if you can, you know, hypothetically imagine Nietzsche in a different culture. He might have been a massive uh, Lutheran criticizing atheism or whatever, you know, but he'd bring it, his tools to bear. The important thing probably is, well, this is arguable, but the ultimate aim is then progress, but not in the typical, not in the typical meaning of progress, of course, you know. What is progress? Well, yeah, this is the interesting question. You know, what do we mean by it? I mean, again, for Nietzsche, it's, it's power and that, that's manifested through complexity. But, you know, like, how do we rescue uh, values that can sustain life from mere power? I mean, that might not be the fairest question, but. Life from mere power. So, people like um, Foucault and Derrida, um, I'm not familiar with these thinkers beyond really introductions, you know, secondary sources, I've read some of the works. But there there is a reliance on a notion of power as that which ultimately is manipulated by human beings for their own ends. uh, they don't give an end beyond just power. It sort of bottoms out at, at this kind of structures, just seek power. There's no notion really of a type of um, aesthetic or yeah. or competence that can stand outside. Where is the telos? Where is the striving? If it's just if it's just power, and for me, for me, it has to be grounded in in the affirmation or rejection of life itself. And there we start bringing back in these notions of good and evil metaphorically to constitute this decision to be for life or against life. And so what we have then as an understanding of evil to understand some of the acts that, that take place in, inside, inside the heart of every human being can be characterized more as a resentment for the conditions of life itself, which are the suffering and tragedy that are endemic to any system that must continually destroy itself in order to rebuild itself and deal with the inherent arbitrariness of the mm. of this polarity of chaos and order and the fact that we balance on a nice knife edge and must harmonize mm. at once it's a wonderfully optimistic view of life but on another it's not it's not naively so because because the figure that binds it together in christianity at least is the figure of the cross mm. and you have the suffering born there by the individual in the face of this so i don't know what you what do you think of that yeah so obviously the roots that us humans are on in terms of evolution and general mental advancement, technological advancement now, is one that has to involve suffering. In fact, not just humans, but, but, but all beings. But uh, humans, of course, because we have this, the unfortunate side effect of being very intelligent and being able to create um, medicine and technology and weapons, whatever, is also the ability to be conscious of suffering. In right. other words, not just feel it, but you know, really suffer because a loved, you know, mostly I would say because a loved one has died, you know, yes, more than oneself, I think, especially with children. So that it goes hand in hand, that heightened consciousness and awareness of things. Yes. Um, so by that principle, if we were to take the next evolutionary step, then suffering would also uh, take that step with us. The suffering's only going to increase. Yeah, no, yeah. So, so with it, with it, but... 
of course, the people like David Pierce, they think that we can eliminate suffering altogether and become more conscious and whatever. I'm very uh, sceptical of that. I don't think it's possible because I think, you know, happiness is really the other side of the coin of suffering. You know, without suffering, you won't, you'll just be bored. It's a sort of relational duality. And um, But what do I think about Christ and being a sort of um, a figure to, I don't know, sympathize with when one is suffering? I think there's also dangers there. I mean, obviously, it's, it brings comfort, and that's arguably one of its main purposes. But at the same time, I mean, C.D. Broad, who Huxley spoke about, to bring it back to him, he wrote that one of the real dangers of Christianity is to stop the advancement of man through, you know, technological or whatever means, genetic means. So we're bordering on eugenics here a bit. Mm. But there was, before the Second World War, there was a, you know, being a liberal generally was being a eugenicist. And so there is, not that I'm promoting eugenics, of course, but there is a danger with Christianity, and this is from Nietzschean point of view as well, of stifling the development of man because, Mm. yeah, it does bring more suffering and so on. And if we only think, if we focus on suffering as a sort of ultimate value of humanity, then I think that will then, yeah, hinder a lot of potential, not only pleasures, but um, other forms of consciousness of which we can only uh, touch upon, you know. So there's a danger, but there's a danger either way. There's also a danger that if you have no consolation, well, then, you know, most, most of humanity will be completely miserable. So there's, there's lots to say here. I mean, I, I don't have the education to make the case for the continual validity of the very best we could say about the Christian picture today. What I, what I mean by that is I couldn't say whether or not they had developed the complete mythological representation of that which could ultimately drive us forward appropriately, something like that. Um, and it's, certainly, I, as far as I understand Peterson's explication through Jung of Christianity and the symbol of Christ, it's not merely the identification with the suffering, but also the transcendence that by taking responsibility for speaking the truth fundamentally, that that is the pathway to transcending or bearing at the very least that suffering and so sort of keeps it in balance. So I don't think, but regardless, I think one attitude that I think I'm trying to have here or arguing for as part of this adaptive Uh, revivification of the structure is at all times to be gracious and to to take the best and to save the best of what your of your of what your culture can give to you and of course then update it now we have room to add uh, basically well yeah and one thing that comes to mind immediately is again from whitehead this notion that the reformation was bad because it it took the worst from christianity from his point of view so the great thing about the Catholic Church, or the Church as it was then, more or less, excluding the Orthodox one, was the um, aesthetic side. You know, these great cathedrals, mm. stained glass, sunlight coming in, these Beautiful. these sublime music, even the Mass in Latin. The beauty of it was that one didn't understand it, you know, he's mm. arguing. And that the value of the Church then was mostly the evocation of an aesthetic sensibility of an understanding that there's something beyond oneself. Yes. And it was necessarily vague because, you know, we can never attain certainty there. Yeah. And what happened with the Reformation, of course, is that um, all this so-called ostentation was lost mm. and there was more focus on, you know, the translation of the Bible into the uh, na- whatever language, German, English and so on. And, um, you know, a sort of purification of the church that so became very simple, you know, white walls and whatever, like you still get in Sweden. Mm. It's kind of Lutheran, Calvinist um, look. Mm. And then, you know, natural theology, you know, rational arguments for why there's an afterlife or why there's a God and whatever. Mm. Um, all of which, I mean, most philosophers will say that they fail, you know. Yeah. Um, although there's one, it's not an argument, but there's one reason for believing in God, which is the argument from experience, which uh, actually is another reason I was brought to um, psychedelics through William James, you know. Right. So, but, you know, that was not a rational argument. Thus, there was no rational criticisms of it. That was an experiential position. Right. So, yeah. Are there things to maintain from the church? Absolutely. Even the great Antichrist Nietzsche said that, you know? Yes. And Whitehead certainly was uh, sympathetic, as I say, to the evocative and the ascetic principles of Christianity, less to the theology. Although there's the whole process theology that has, um, was born through Whitehead in America. Nonetheless, I think that really veered far too, it's, it's just too far away from Whitehead's intention. Nonetheless, you know, it was, it was very inspirational. So certainly there can be, um, there are, well, without question, values in Christianity. Even walking into a church, you know, in the middle of a city, as I did in Exeter a few weeks ago, it was just so tranquil and calm. It's just a pity that it comes with a lot of this theological baggage, you know. 
but there's a need for it. I mean, like the Eleusinian Mysteries, there is a there there is this I don't say spiritual, but there is this need to get outside of everyday life for all people. Yes. I mean, Schopenhauer again speaks about a metaphysical need we all have. I think it's there, and I think that one of the sort of um, let's say disharmonies in society in Western society today is this. You know, we've become so intellectualized that we can't buy Christianity. You know, encapsulated in God is dead. The phrase God is dead. However, the metaphysical need I believe is still there. Right. What replaces that? What replaces that? Yeah. So, so then you get um, then you get these sort of um, new age movements and so on, and also communism, Pe- neo paganism, and fascism of a kind. That, right. Yeah. That is a demonstration of this fixation of what turned out to be a very shallow system of values, but a fixation of them as the top god of your value mm. structure that then cannot be challenged and Solzhenitsyn explicates this as right at the individual level unwillingness of people to tell the truth to tell the truth of their own suffering and therefore fundamentally there's no revivification possible there and you have millions dead yeah you know it's fascinating actually because Nietzsche says you know Christianity killed itself in terms of uh, seeking truth and it sought mm-hmm. truth away from it Nietzsche thought another interesting thing about communism of course and you know, Bertrand Russell said, you know, uh, there's a complete match between Christianity and communism, you know, so the Messiah is Marx, mm-hmm. the elect are the proletariat, you know, and so mm-hmm. on and so forth. And Nietzsche, although he was concomitant with Marx, he, he criticized socialism for being a legacy of Christianity. So on the one side, we get the continuation of Christianity through socialism, communism, one could argue. Mm. And at the same time, that metaphysical need was sort of brought out in New Age neo-pagan movements and so on. And they were both, in a way, the kind of split of Christianity after, after it reached this, this intellectual point where it just people could not accept it very much, especially with, you know, higher criticism from Germany, you know, the questioning of who wrote the Bible and the evolution, of course, Darwinian evolution. Mm-hmm. They reached this intellectual point where it couldn't be justified anymore. So, yeah, then you get the split off, which is communism. It's like, okay, we still believe that all are equal under the eyes of God. How are we going to create that in a political system? Yep. And then... If you get the rejection of that, you get, well, you know, there's still this need to believe in something higher than us, something more important than us. And it seems to me the New Age movement didn't know where to place that at all. And of course, nihilism is on the other side of that as well, which is nothing. We, there's just yeah. can be nothing there. And so you're sort of in this, in the, a different kind of static. In the abyss. Yeah, in the abyss. Yeah. So, and uh, that ultimate, all of that, of course, um, led to existentialism in the 20th century. You know, this notion of like, what the hell? <laughs> What's going on here? Pick up the pieces. Yeah, and um, and it seems we're still dealing with that. I, right. th- I don't think society has, has come to any form of harmony, and I, if it were to come to any harmony with it, like some new kind of Eleusinian mystery, then that could easily stagnate again, and you'd need... But nonetheless, all of that is... I mean, I'm almost only Hegelian now, you know, thesis, antithesis, to synthesis. But nonetheless, if we believe in... I mean, I'm... So, with nihilism... Yeah, you know, I'm a you know what I call neo-nihilist, so I do believe that there are no objective uh, normative values. Could we call them fixed values in this sense, just to help yeah. me out, get yeah. on board? So- yeah, fixed objective values. So like there is an absolute good, an absolute evil, you know? So you look- That takes on a fixed instantiated form that's codified into a certain yeah. set so of the actions. Ultimate, okay. um, epitome of that is the Ten Commandments, you know, something okay. like this, God given. But if you don't believe in God, and if you don't believe in Platonic forms, then you've got no reason to believe in that. This is the interesting point of God is dead again. Also, if you don't believe in an ultimate purpose, then of course, you know, if you know the purpose of something, then you know whether that something is good for that or yes, not. You yes. know, if you know the purpose of a knife is to cut, you know, a good knife is a sharp one, right? Yes. But if man, this is existentialism, now if man has no purpose, then how can you talk about good or a bad man? You can't without that. Now, maybe we still have a purpose, we'll come back to that. Yes. But if you don't believe it, you don't believe in God, a God-given purpose, if you believe only in, then, well, first of all, and if you look at the, you know, different cultures around time and and space, you know, you realize that, um, you know, in Victorian age, it was immoral to, for a woman to show her wrist or something like this. And yes. today it's immoral to, you know, whatever, touch a woman's knee, <laughs> whatever yeah. it is today. And in 50 years, it's going to be something else. Yep. You become a relativist just from a historical sense as well. It's very easy to slip into that, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So there's neo nihilism in a basic form. It's just that, yeah, there can't be any prescriptive. You can't say a person should do this or should not do this because according to what? Yes. If you don't believe in, there's no standard. Yes. However, there are still values, subjective values. Right. And of course, nobody wants, just because they don't believe in a, an eternal God or a, a commandment which says, you know, you should respect your mother and father, doesn't mean, therefore, if you don't believe in that, you want to kill them. Of course not. You know, there's still characteristics a person has, and there are objective values. It's two very separate things. So you can still have your characteristics, which are based on, partly based on your subjective values. 
And you can still strive to push those subjective values in society. So you can still maintain a political viewpoint, you know, let's say you don't like rubbish around your village or something like this. Yeah, that's a personal thing. And you could therefore instantiate, you know, policies which will get rid of that, you know, bins and whatever. But of course, if someone were theoretically, they wouldn't happen in this case, but it's theoretical, if someone would say, you know what, I like I like rubbish yeah. around, you couldn't say, well, you're wrong. Yes. At that fundamental point, you're yeah. then you, the nihilism steps in again. And you, yeah. and you say, well, look, I'm just pushing I'm afraid I'm, this is just a conflict, like a fight. I'm yes. going to fight you for this. Yes. But that's what it comes down to, a fight. And, okay, in that example, you know, that would never happen. But think about um, abortion. Yes, no, absolutely. Theories of abortion, right? So at the fundamental level, it's about whether you think um, an embryo has intrinsic value. And it's just, unless you are religious, if you're not religious, if you reject that and you, you reject objective standards as well, like, um, and ultimately, secular, ostensibly secular moralities like utilitarianism do have those absolute standards. In other words, pleasure is good, pain is bad. There comes a point where you can't argue the case anymore. There's no, there's no fundamental justification either way. Right, no, I understand. Unless it becomes theological, because, you know, you might say, well, the value of child is God-given. It's like, okay, so let's then debate whether God exists, you know, so. Right. But also, it might be the case that a trivial argument about whether there should be rubbish or not sort of devolves into a, a sort of a fixed moment. In debating such a thing, one is sort of intellectualizing away from the real as it moves in qualitative duration. And this is a bit of a jump now to bring Bergson back in here. But if, if we are committed to the idea that the real is movement, and that what is most real about being itself is that, um, or perhaps what characterizes it more than anything else is its movement, then it seems like in order to preserve what is most real, what we need to hold as our highest value is the kind of communicative reformation behavior fundamentally that is most aligned to, to movement and adaptation itself. And so... You see, well, there, though, I'd bring in pluralism, you know, so there are movements, there are durations, but they are, there are many. And at times they're not, they're not you know, mutually yeah, compatible. Is, right. Can they be entirely disparate? I mean, that might be the question. It, yeah, well, no, they, the they can't, yeah. Is whether the grand nodal structure of being and movement can be disparate from itself. And in such a case, it seems like all one would have there is power to distinguish. But if these nodes of order and being are connected and, in fact, built on this same affective telos, this yeah. movement, this movement out of fixation, which can, which in order to be for itself, is for being, mm. is for life, given that we are wrapped up, it, we are manifestations of this process at the highest form we, we know. Okay, so, so I, I notice you always, yeah, ultimately it concerns this, this sort of relationship between chaos, you know, different harmonies. So, certain minor harmonies would be chaotic to a larger one. Yes. So like a, a biker gang might in itself be very harmonious, follow yes. laws of honor and so on. But in terms of a, a state, it might be very disharmonious. So then the question is, should that smaller state, the gang, give in to harmonize with the larger one? Or does the larger one actually benefit from some disharmony? Oh, absolutely. Um, does it sort of um, shake its foundations and make, make it sort of question what it really values and so on? Could be either, depending, couldn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's the Loki, isn't the, lo the trickster archetype something right. very common? Right. You know, there needs to be that, that, that shaking up constantly to preserve harmony, perhaps, Absol right? Absolutely, it does. So, so the danger then, of course, is ultimate moralism, where you say, you know, you can't do this, you know, you have, you have to step in line, because then you would get a total stagnant state. And this is what we see in, you know, communist Russia, I suppose, and North Korea yep. and whatnot. And um, also in our society, in other ways, I should say, I don't think you can get rid of disharmony. Same within a body as well, you know, so we've got, um, you know, there's the overall, what Kos Arthur Kosler calls, you know, the whole on that is our body. But within it, there are separate entities, you know, like um, the uh, bacterial colony in our guts and uh, our organs and our, you know, each cell in our body is it's in a way an autopoetic, a self-sufficient system, yeah, right? Yeah. And if the individual, if the larger organism, the human yeah. person is strong and healthy, they will work in harmony. Of course, cancer is when that stops working in harmony or where or like a virus when it can see disharmony that's chaos but of course good thing about you know this is how vaccinations work you know you give it a little bit of chaos and then the whole 
the larger holon becomes stronger. Yeah, that's a beautiful analogy, yeah, actually, yeah. And so doesn't society itself need its vaccinations in terms of, you know, the criminal? Absolutely. I think there's better sorts of criminals than others, right? I mean, there's a certain type of playing with the boundaries that's appropriate and, and, certain, and certain kinds that might appear so initially, but ultimately might lead to the development of or an instantiation of a, a different kind of value structure that, is, that their branches often becomes incompatible. And Cancer can kill and so can the virus, yeah. Exactly. And so the thing is, is that in this grand cog-like revolving multinodal structure that is being has to, in order to update itself and remain moving, necessarily spawn off elements of it that can actually evolve to challenge it. Yes. And that is why this view is not inherently optimistic, because it maintains the absolute destructive potential yeah. of ourselves to ourselves. In fact, isn't that really the ultimately the cause of evolution and, you know, the cause of us as such? In other words, the constant overcoming of obstacles evolving against them right. in order to attain this complexity that we have now. Right. And so my question when it comes from taking a conversation like this, which is which has gone into the heart of what even appears as I say it to myself, a type of esoteric language, to action in the world. You sort of recognize that, well, people the world over are are involved in starting little projects and then maintaining them and then providing value to people or not. Mm. And we sort of, life is this constant collectivizing of certain values and, and activities. And then out there goes that little engine of production or doing something. And then it does its thing in the world and it contributes to the grand picture in some way. Mm. And, you know, we have all, we have so many different life at the moment is characterized by such a such a chaotic unknown because of how quickly technology is moving, but also how... Plus the lack of uh, God, you know, uh, belief in God. In the, the amount of turmoil our value structure currently has as a result of this. Yes. It's, it's, it's not clear what the, what the largest threats are. It's, it's not clear whether the fundamental nature of certain Islamic sects can be commensurate with certain other value systems. And, and then we have, we have cryptocurrency looking to decentralize how we do transactions. We have potential for viruses. We have um, various splinterings of different ideological the movements. Automation of labor, which is automation of labor, AI, which change. AI, which is absolutely outrageous. Overpopulation, pollution, and then most presciently, perhaps, is the current rift between elements of the left and the right playing out in maybe even university campuses right now in America, mm. con congregate and Canada and the Western world in general, congregating, coalescing into this agitation and sort of harsh divide between diversity and protection on the one side and then free expression on the other and it's very clear with to me which side of that formulation i fall on the side of it's expression and communicative mm. reformation and that comes first and um mm. we don't need to over protect people i think it's no. it's a it's a big problem but i don't necessarily want to it's a bit like the danger of consolation of christianity mm. it's the same principle yeah any structure that, that doesn't allow individuals to go out and redeem themselves and develop themselves so that they can become their own mm. potential, their own potential node fundamentally, because they are, they embody the same fundamental principles that ought to, that ought to harmonize and constitute mm. the group is that the morality for all this, your relation to God is within you as well, you know, and, and so, and so the pattern is a meta pattern that, that pervades all, but um, of, of this adaptation this going out, coming back, adapting according to Mm. in movement but i began that little segment there talking about what could be the the practical devotion of one's time or the, or the practical action in the world that might go about steadying the ship fundamentally is, is moving okay, yeah. towards the center and 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 this is where and i just want to put this to you very briefly that the process of communication itself this honest vulnerable dialogue itself on an individual level is that unit of is that unit of adaptation and this is the central idea at the heart of what jordan peterson is doing and so right. what then we might be looking for is technology somehow that can enable this communication without an imprint of bias of too much bias if possible and pr pr protections for this as 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 being our bulwark against against degeneration mm. fundamentally the protection against degeneration is providing individuals the avenue for communicative reformation vulnerable truth seeking in dialogue with others something like that okay talking about practical benefits of um well let's say my neo-nihilism it's this that 
you recognize that what you formerly believed were moral absolutes are actually uh, not, and they can help one nonetheless. They can be helpful to you, but they can be hindrances to oneself as well. With relation, let's say, a practical thing like um, campus um, conflicts, as you were mentioning, I mean, a sort of neo nihilistic analysis of that would simply be this that both sides hold, well, yeah, ultimately both sides hold, unwittingly hold, objective morals. So on the left, you generally get the objective moral that, um, number one, everyone deserves equal treatment. Yep. Right? You can't actually logically substantiate that. You might subjectively value it, you know, of course, it might be your preference. But there's an ultimately no way of defending that. On the other side, though, and I was reading, a Mil- you know, Milton wrote an article defending free speech, interestingly. This seems to be the fundamental antithesis, which is, yeah, free speech, you know. But, of course, ultimately, you can't substantiate that as a value either. So here, like abortion, you get two objective values that sort of fight each other. But, personally, I take the Milton's point of view, the freedom of expression, because my subjective value, which is, you know, ultimately is progress, not in a liberal sense, but the progress of, of uh, the universe itself through man. Right. And um, that will be achieved, as Milton himself argued hundreds of years ago, through, yeah, debate. You know, let's, right. let's put our cards on the table and see how they commensurate. I think also with, um, you know, the sort of deplatforming things you get today from, from today's new left or whatever. Yep. It's just, uh, it's just very much power politics anyway. You right. Know, it's, um, you know, we demand these rights and uh, we, we don't like these old power structures. When you get equality... All that means is that you've got um, a lower power structure acquiring an equal power structure to its then nemesis. You know, it's, it's opposite, as it were. But of course, it will never, I don't think that will ever lie in harmony. I don't think when equality is reached, that will be it. There, there will be people who then try to push it. Right. And so there will be eternal conflict there. But the ultimate point is this from neonalism that, you know, you can't, you can't substantiate. Why should everyone be equal? You know, I mean, ultimately, that's what it comes down to. And it's harsh. Right. Can we distinguish between equality of opportunity and outcome here? Yeah. I mean, I can totally get on board from the sense of the equality of outcome. It's a ridiculous yeah. notion in, in the yeah. ways you indicate. But in terms of opportunity, it seems to me that... Well, I, I think personally, yeah, you should um, offer, subjectively, I believe, yeah, you should absolutely offer equality of opportunity because that's for the benefit, again, of my subjective view, which is this kind of um, progress of complexity in the universe through through mankind however yes that is my personal preference yes okay so i understand you're saying your personal preference here but i can also identify with that as you being for life as you yeah, as you absolutely. consider it so maybe i think this is where we're going to touch it maybe there is and this as we started with talking about this drive for knowledge yeah maybe there is this greater telos which i embody we all embody for this kind of ultimate end of continual a continual striving not only for power but power is part of it because if you don't if you can't control your yeah, environment absolutely. you're going to die right yeah. or you're going to evolve away yes. so power is part of it but maybe power is actually just itself a means to allow for expanding complexity in terms of consciousness yeah, exactly. you know? i think that's right because i think power ends with fixation well in, in well, some ways it, yeah, it's maybe perhaps it's like money, you know. So money is a great means to acquire greater levels, right. but it's if you fixate yourself on money, yeah. then that's um, shallow and yeah. valueless in itself. However, I mean that is very, I mean, you know, talking about this ultimate telos there of complexity is very is very metaphysical and something I can't prove. But right. uh, but like I said, you there's no way of proving exactly. it and this because it's metaphysics and it's not science. This is where James comes in because he talks about the, sorry to interrupt, no. he talks about the, like, it's not, and, and you sort of need the, it's like a, it's built, the view is built or finally instantiated or given its force by a faith that in so pursuing that communicative reformation, that vulnerable truth seeking, that that will bring about the whole project for the better. Yeah, well, an analogy would be something like this. Our immune system, right? If you look at um, bacteria, virus, whatever, entering the, the body, if you look at white blood cells, you know, they will chase a bacteria until they've got it, you know, and eat it. And they have got this real drive. Now, if you're a panpsychist, you will believe that those cells have got their own sentience, mm-hmm. their own wills, and I do believe that for logical reasons. They don't know... Although they've got this, it seems at least, this strong drive to eat this bacterium, they don't know that they're actually acting on behalf of the greater organism. You know, I don't believe they've got this consciousness. And perhaps it's the same in us humans. You know, we have certain drives which actually are for 
uh, our drives on a on a, a higher level, a higher holonic level of which we are not conscious. But that's irrelevant. We still are moved by them. Mm. And uh, you know, one does. You know, I do have sympathy for that, but it can only ever be speculative, I believe, unless there are some other good reasons for believing it, which would make sense of something else down the line. It's it's something I haven't really looked into, but. I think actually most people believe it. I mean, okay, you've got the collective unconscious of, of Jung, but also you've got, just in terms of uh, evolution, right, like neo-Darwinian Darwinian evolution even, you know, the sexual uh, impulse, right? You know, your attraction to a woman or a man or whatever, not goats, you know, <laughs> to another human, <laughs> let's say, the right, bit there. is you don't consciously think, oh, I'm going to add to the survival of the species here. You right. know? That's not your motive, of course. It's not, you just think about, you know, whatever in the flesh. But nonetheless, it seems that we have that lower motive due to a higher motive. Mm. So we have the lower conscious motive, but that's really part and parcel of a broader, higher one. And I don't think, I think, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find someone who denied that. So in, in, like, in like fashion, there might be other drives, apart from the sexual drive that we have, which are part of a, a larger one of which we are unconscious. Yeah, that's really, really well put. I think there is a real bridge between what we're thinking here, because I can totally get on board with where we currently sit. There is no, in a sense, there's no proof for it. That's why there's a vulnerability in stepping out and embodying this value structure. And you seem to have a very similar one. Yeah. But what's very important is this. You have to distinguish metaphysics from science and not make metaphysics a handmaid of science. You know, science can, can't, well, like I said, can't get at proofs anyway, if you believe in falsificationism. You can only talk about proofs and maths and logic. And even that, then the connection to reality is very questionable. Right. So we have to realize that our knowledge has to go beyond proof. Because if you only relied on proof, you're very limited in what you could know. Like some, you know, axioms of logic, maths, some equations, and, you know, the cogito, I think therefore I am perhaps. Yeah. And that's it. You couldn't even know other people are conscious. You know, these are inferences. These, you can't prove another person's conscious. Yeah. Even by neural correlates of consciousness and behavior, you're still, you're still an inference to a certain extent. So, um, yeah, you have to understand metaphysics is a, another means of acquiring knowledge, but that knowledge is not proof knowledge. Something else. Yeah, and then you've, you've got the room to speculate, and obviously some speculations are, are valid or true and others are not. So then you have to sort of think about, well, what arguments could you use in its favour? Right. But um, we humans are not, you know, we don't have the capability of omniscience. Right. What we do have the capability of is striding out into the forest, striding out into the unknown, and hopefully coming back. And what that sort of, well, I had a mind to bring in psychedelics a little bit here because it struck me that psychedelics are a tool that sort of it can be used in a in short doses to sort of go go between these sort of levels yes like feel the higher level but then also you, you rec might recognize how an affective pull of of a uh, seduction might relate to you the, the the larger entity so yeah interestingly so if there are these higher holons right or systems of teleology that move one like perhaps galaxies that move the solar system in a very subtle way, and thus you, could, although we're not generally conscious of it, could we acquire consciousness of it by dismissing our normal physiological functioning? Possibly. This is an interesting yeah. thing, and, and uh, there's a lot of reports which seem to corroborate that. So, for example, when we're talking about rhythm of duration and Bergson, it seems that, yes, yeah, certainly on psychedelics, you can see time slowing down mm -hmm. or speeding up. In other words, we lose that um, speed of time that we have, and thus we gain sympathy with other life forms lower than us perhaps mm -hmm. but also yeah exactly higher with a higher than us perhaps you know there's very very common to experience um unity with everything mm -hmm. you know so perhaps that then is rejecting our individual our individualism and then entering that larger holon which has that greater teleology perhaps or no teleology yeah. but again you know the interesting thing is like you feel it but what kind of knowledge does that give you? Yep. I mean, William James, as you know, spoke about the noetic quality of mystical states. In other words, when you're there, you just know it's real. Mm. But of course, after that, you might doubt yourself oh, yeah, you, exactly. because you lose the noetic, noeticism. But, you know, it seems that the noetic quality he's talking about is something like, you know, you know that one plus one is two, or you know modus ponens, modus tollens must be true. You know, modus ponens is logical axiom that, uh, you know, if P then Q, P therefore Q, right? You know yeah. it has to fall. But if I ask you why, everyone would be very hard pressed to, to give a justification but you know it you just know it and that seems to be an intuition mm. even at the, on the basic level of logic and maths and whatever so although I've n I don't think I personally have ever really had this but William James certainly talks about it as a common theme in mystical states 
which you could equate with psychedelic states, that there's this sort of noetic knowledge in the psychedelic state which is equivalent to that logical one. So therefore, isn't that as valid a knowledge, you know? Well, basically, you can't know if you're, unless you're in it yourself. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely... And that's why metaphysics has to be brought to bear upon these experiences rather than simply just science or psychology. Right. Or psychology as we know it today, you know, in quantitative ways. It's certainly the living of it, you know, certainly the experiencing of it. And it changes what, yeah, per, I mean, the living of it. For, for me, it's made me appreciate nature much more than I did. Mm. And uh, in fact, really, I remember writing after my first, one of my first trips, like, just got this massive appreciation for art, paintings, nature, theology even, you know. It just somehow enriches your interest in things. So it's a valuable tool for, for certain people. Yeah. Well, Peter, I could and will talk to you for many more hours to come, but I think there seem, we seem to have uh, arrived at a nice, a nice place of closure here. Yeah. And is there anything you want to say to people listening about where they can get in contact with you or, or what they can read further of your work? Yeah, okay. So, well, my book is called Numenautics, as you mentioned. Um, it's available from Amazon, but better to buy it from Psychedelic Press directly. My website is philosopher.eu. I've got a Facebook philosophy page called Ontologistics. You make frequent updates on that. It's actually yeah. pretty good. I recommend, I recommend liking it because it feels that Facebook feed when you're abjectly scrolling when you should be doing something else with, uh, with some good stuff. So. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I, because of my PhD, I have to read all the time. And, yeah, uh, you're reading and, all the bloody time, yeah. man. You're putting me to shame. Oh, my God. I'm, I'm like, sorry. holy damn. Uh, yeah, well, anyway, so when I, when I read an interesting line, um, I thought I'll share that with the world. You know? I, I'm going to start. I already have, and I'm going to start doing the, doing yeah. the same thing. And um, that would be cool. Yeah, share the knowledge. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So also Twitter, Peter Schust at H, and um, here and there, you know. But um, I'm based at Exeter University at the moment, living in Penwith, Cornwall. So, uh, yeah, I'm... Well, man, I'm please put it here. It's <laughs> honestly been... It's been beautiful. So, there we go, then. It's been a pleasure for me. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to hear more of these conversations and to stay in touch about events planned later this year in Melbourne, please do like the Facebook page. Follow Voice Club underscore on Twitter. Subscribe on YouTube. There'll be videos soon. And most other places you usually listen to your podcasts. Best of all, sign up to the mailing list via the Connect tab at voiceclub.com. And if you found this valuable, please consider sharing or leaving a review. The final part of the series with Peter will be out soon. It's quite short. More of an added bonus we sat down to record after signing off here. All right. We'll see you then. <laughs>